have a meeting now? Ooh, I'm hot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, we're going to have a meeting now. Let's get seated, folks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Fourth Dimension Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Susan Coe, and I'm going to be your alcoholic chairperson for this evening. Please help me open the meeting with a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer. Father, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are all glad you're here, especially newcomers. In keeping with our singleness of purpose, however, and our third tradition, which states the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, we ask that all who participate confine their discussion to problems with alcohol. Is there anyone present who's at their first meeting or in their first 30 days of sobriety? Now, this is not meant to embarrass you. This is just so we can get to know you. Don't be scared. I'm Mike. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sweating. Raise your hand. Come on. Michelle, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Michelle. Any new people from this side? It's all old timers on this side. Next time, sit on this side. The smart kids. Okay. Oh, we do. Is there anybody else? Okay, is there anybody here from out of the county or state that would like to be acknowledged? I'm Justin, I'm an alcoholic. Justin. From where are you from, Justin? Spring Hill. Hey! Welcome. Anybody else? Okay, let's get back to business here. Uh, Brian, wait, who's gonna? Brian's gonna read the preamble. Get away! I'm Brian, an alcoholic. Hey, Brian. It's our preamble. Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is, is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, or organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy. Neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Barbara is going to read the steps. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back, yeah. This I'm wall back. Right. No. <laughs> Hi, I'm Barbara and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, These are the 12 steps. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. 
three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, if you could please silence your cell phones at this time. Also, we ask if you could please refrain from getting up and down during the speakers, but if you must, please do so quietly. And if you're going to smoke, we ask that you please be away from any of the buildings, and if you see a butt on the ground, what are you supposed to do? I got you guys trained right. (laughs) And please be respectful as we are guests of the church. Also, if you have any announcements in between speakers, please see our group secretary. Group secretary, Matt. He's raising his hand in case you... Thank you. Um, Okay, I guess we're going to introduce the first speaker. Our first speaker, I just met him, and he's uh, Devin from My Turn group in South Tampa. Tampa. (laughs) Hi, my name is Devin. I'm an alcoholic. Oh man, I really hate speaking. I'm not going to lie. But every time someone asks me, I know it's a sign that I need to do more in my program. And uh, this is the second time someone asked me this week, so I must really be doing something wrong. Maybe. But uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. Come from a normal family. Neither of my parents are alcoholic. Uh, I have people in my family who are addicts and alcoholics, but not my parents. Um, my father was a narcotics cop in New Jersey. <laughs> so, it's enough said. Um, I started drinking probably when I was like 12 years old, and uh, a lot of other things too, but I won't get into that. It's an AA meeting, but. Um, You know, most normal 12-year-old kids are, like, trading baseball cards and, like, whatever a normal 12-year-old kid does. But I was, like, hustling dirtbags to buy me booze, you know, from a young age. So I just fell in love with drinking from the start. I just liked the way it made me feel. I liked what what I didn't have to feel. Whatever problems a 12-year-old kid has, I don't know. I didn't have any. (laughs) But I, I created them in my mind like I still do today. But, um... You know, I got in trouble a lot as a kid, and my father always helped me out, and most of the time it wasn't too embarrassing for him because he worked undercover, so he'd come there in plain clothes if it was a different precinct. And uh, but one time sticks out in my mind that he had to pick me up. He was in uniform doing a payroll job, and he had to pick me up from juvenile jail when I was a kid. So there was a lot of disappointment in me when I was a kid. I was a middle child, a typical middle child, I guess. My other siblings didn't have the same type of issues I had, but, um, so I stood out in a bad way, but, um, you know, I finally got in trouble over my head to where my father wasn't going to help me anymore. Um, I was 17, I was getting charged as an adult, and my father told me if he intervenes, then I got to go in the Marine Corps. That was our agreement, and the agreement with the prosecutor, and it wasn't just something I could promise and not do. I had to sign a contract on the spot the recruiter <laughs> so, so I I did and uh, about a couple of weeks after I graduated high school somehow 
I went in the Marine Corps. Um, you know, I was I was young, but I was I was kind of excited about it. I had like in boot camp, I kind of thought maybe I should have just went to jail for a little bit. This, is, <laughs> this sucks. But uh, once I got in the Marine Corps, I realized I really I really liked it a lot. You know, I I stood out in a good way there, and uh, Marines like to drink, so no one had a problem right away with my drinking. And uh, you know, I, I remember pulling up to, I was stationed in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, I remember pulling up, and it looked like Animal House in the barracks, I was like, this is going to be awesome, and, and uh, I went to get my room key, and I go to find my room, and there's two Marines on a, like a catwalk, like a balcony, and they're, one of them's breaking a bottle over the other guy's head, and I'm like, these guys, I hope I'm, I live near them, and they were, they were my roommates, and uh, one of them is one of us today, and the other one's I don't know where. So 50%. Well, but um, I uh, during the war in Iraq, I, I deployed. I went to Iraq. Uh, I lost. I lost a lot of good friends there, and I uh, came home for a short period of time, and then went to Afghanistan right away. So I had a lot of time overseas, and uh, as soon as I got back, is where my drinking really just. It got to a point where it wasn't, it wasn't fun, you know, and stops being fun. That's, that was my point right there. And uh, I drank over a lot. I had a lot of guilt. Um, I, drank, I was an everyday drinker at this point for years. Um, and, you know, I hit a point where it just stopped working. Anything stopped working. And I had a, a habit for a long time that I got rid of for a short period of time, so I thought I was good. I was just drinking, but... I felt like, you know, just dead inside, and uh, I started, I didn't want to just pick up a gun and shoot myself in the head, but I contemplated it plenty of times. I would have rather overdosed or something else. I mean, as stupid as that sounds, that's how, that's how my brain was working at the time. But, um, you know, I, I really had no clue what was wrong with me. I thought everything, I just had bad luck. You know, I really didn't think I had anything wrong with me. I, uh, I started getting in trouble again, and I had to go to 13 weeks of uh, anger management at the Veterans Hospital. And, uh, <laughs> well, first, this is in New Jersey still. I, I got permanently banned from the Veterans Hospital. <laughs> and then uh, I did the, the whole, you know, climatic change. I moved to Tampa from New Jersey at this point, and then I got the 13 weeks of anger management down here. <laughs> so I did it, I had to. And then uh, after I got done with it, I, uh, I had to talk to a therapist. And the first question she asked me is, how, you know, how much do I drink and all that? And I was kind of confused by that, but at this point, <laughs> things were so bad that uh, I didn't listen to her, but I don't have much time, but I'll get sober in a second. Um, a lot of time went by, and I just, my mindset was getting no better. I was getting in trouble, and, uh, you know, things happened before us, but I woke up and decided to go to an AA meeting. I'd been to them in one in New Jersey and never went back. But I, you know, when I first moved down here, I had a, an attorney help me pro bono, which I couldn't understand doing something for somebody else for free. And the first meeting I walked into, he was in the meeting, and he doesn't go to this meeting. His wife does. He never goes. And that's how I met my sponsor, and I started working a program. You know, I went out, came back, had a lot of other things happen. I, I stopped drinking for a short period of time, started doing other things, and then, you know, May 2nd, 2011 is my sobriety date. And uh, my life today is amazing. I have, I have like, high-class problems. <laughs> I really do. You know, I get done complaining to my sponsor about stuff, and I'm like, wow, those are good problems. <laughs> These aren't that bad, you know? But uh, my life's awesome today. I mean, every day's, not every day, but some days are hard for me. I, I don't, you know, I do want to drink sometimes, but I don't. I come to a meeting. I say I'll go to a meeting, I'll drink after. And of course, I never do. This, this program's amazing, it saved my life. And if you're new, this sounds probably sounds really weird to you, all the things you're hearing here, but it, it comes together. It did for me, and if I could get sober, any, anybody could. But thanks for letting me share.
Thank you, Devin. And is he here? Who's going to read the traditions? Oh, Chris is going to. Chris Kaplan is not. He's on a motorcycle ride somewhere. Okay. Hi everybody, my name is Chris Kelly, I'm an alcoholic. Yes. These are the 12 traditions. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants, they do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. For every... Each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Twelve, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Look in here. And Sean is going to come up and do the chips. I'm Sean, I'm an alcoholic. Take it easy in the front row. <laughs> and this group has a, a custom on handing out chips for various lengths of sobriety, so if you have the time, please come up and take a chip. And the first one we offer is a, a silver chip for 24 hours. Hey, there he is. And that's Damien, everybody. Yeah. Next one we offer is a red chip for one month. There we go. So, that's Ashley and Kim. The next one we offer is a gold chip for two months. So <laughs> <the> first. <laughs> and that's Diantha. <laughs> and the next one we offer is a green chip for three months. <laughs> And that's Brenna. Next one we offer is a blue chip for six months. Uh, and a purple chip for nine months. Then we offer a red poker chip for one year. And that's Trisha, everybody. And we offer a red chip again, but we flip it over for multiples. All right. Woo you two? No. You one? Eric? Yes. Eric's got yes. one year. Thank you.
Anyways, that was Melanie with four years, correct? Yeah. Four years. And Eric has one year. Yeah. Thanks for letting me be a service. Yeah. Well, what was that, Carmen? We couldn't hear you. <laughs> okay. And now, all the way from Tampa, we have Terry from YPG. All right, Terry. Hey, I'm uh, Terry. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Terry. Um, I got sober July 20th, 2009. My home group's the Tampa Young People's Group. We meet every Thursday night at 7.30 over at uh, Hyde Park Methodist Church. If you don't know how to get there, there's a bunch of people here that come out often, and it's always a pleasure to see them. Um, I've got a sponsor, and uh, I have the pr privilege of sponsoring other guys, and that's like the biggest thing in my life today. Um, I often forget that. But it truly is the biggest miracle that's taken place in my life is to carry a message of uh, something good. Actually, something not bad. You know, like I, my whole life, man, I've just been bringing bad into the world. You know, as far back as I can remember, that's my that's my perception of my life is everything's bad. Um, you know, I can really re relate to what Devin was talking about, about being 12 years old and having 12 year old problems. What kind of problems do 12 year olds have? If you asked me when I was 12, I would have given you a very long list of problems that I had, you know. <laughs> Looking back at it, I wish I was 12 again, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I asked Devin to come out tonight. As soon as I saw Devin, I knew I, you know, he was, he was my kind of people. You know, he's alcoholic, he's hopeless, um, looked like he put his hands on people for fun. And I can relate to that. Um, I'm a violent guy. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with my alcoholism, though. I just know that I like to beat people up and get beat up. Um, to be honest, because you know when you're like when you're like me, when I was like six years old, I would turn around, I'd get off the bus, turn around, and punch the first person behind me. And when it happened to be a fifth grader, I got beat up. And you know, I was a first grader, and I, I did it anyways. You know, and I just been weird my whole life, like not making a whole lot of sense as far back as I can remember. Always being angry, and uh, I can tell you when I when I opened up the big book for the first time, and I started to read the doctor's opinion, and I got to that part where he mentions the three words: irritable, restless, and discontented. Something happened inside of me. I knew, I knew I, I, I could relate to that. Like that, that's vocabulary I can put my finger on. You know, I know that very well, and uh, and that's how I was, man, my whole life before a drink. You know, and uh, and uh, to not have that today is is pretty amazing. But um, I was like that my whole life. You know, and and we moved we moved down to Tampa from uh, from Philadelphia when I was a young kid and. As soon as we got here, uh, everything just kind of got thrown on its head. You know, my mom started uh, taking a lot of pills. My sister started gangbanging, and uh, my dad just worked as hard as he could to keep food on the table and keep the lights on, you know. And, uh, and I blamed all of them for every problem that I had as a young kid, you know. And really, I didn't stop blaming them until I did a fist step with my sponsor. Um, <laughs> I tried to convince him that it was still their fault, but he wasn't having it. And... Um, you know, at 13, I encountered alcohol for the first time, and uh, me and my buddy, you know, we break into his parents' liquor cabinet. We drank some tequila, and it didn't do it that night. Um, I pretended to be drunk, but I, looking back, I don't remember feeling any different, you know? And what that tells me is I just like to fit in, you know what I mean? Like, I just want you to like me and think I'm cool and funny and stuff like that. And, uh, but I didn't think about drinking after that, you know? And all that, all that anger and all that kind of that feeling different stuff that I had going on, um, that went away when I went and played sports, you know, so sports was like my, my escape. It was like the, the one place I could go to and I didn't have to worry about anything, you know, and, uh, and I was pretty good at it and, uh, I did pretty well in school. And then I had this, this kind of thing where I'd get home and I just, you know, I was crazy. I was insane. You know, my parents once, one time took me to see a therapist. He mentioned that I may have some kind of, uh, mental disorder. I jumped over the table to prove him wrong. And, uh, <laughs> you know. Again, I can relate to Devin. I wasn't welcome back to that therapist's office. Um, but, uh, you know, just just being crazy all over the place, you know. And um, next time I drank, I was, uh, I was like 17 years old. Um, I'm at this party and everybody else there is drinking, you know. And uh, I'm watching these guys and they're like talking to girls and they have no problem doing it. And I'm just sitting there like, man, how do you do that, you know. And, uh, and this guy walked by me and I, I took the cup out of his hand and this dude was, he was real big and he told me that he was going to beat me up if I didn't chug what was in the cup. 
and I was pretty sure he could he could take care of me. So I, I chugged that stuff, you know, and it was terrible. God, I was like, man, this tastes bad. It burns. It makes my stomach feel weird. You guys, and I remember like putting that cup down and being like, you guys are dumb for drinking this stuff. I'm better than that. I'm an athlete. I'm an academic. I'm a smart guy. You know all this stuff. And the guy came back, and uh, I just got my first speeding ticket, and he told me, I'll pay that speeding ticket for you if you drink this one. And I was like, all right, I, I can overlook all of my moral values to get a speeding ticket. <laughs> And uh, I drank that cup in the same fashion as the first one. And the last thing I remember from that night is, uh, as I put it down, my buddy goes, you shouldn't have done that. That was a uh, Bacardi 151. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but it tastes bad. I don't want to drink that again. And uh, I wake up the next morning, man, in a bathtub. And, uh, you know, I'm in my underwear. I don't know where the hell I'm at. And I'm covered in pee and puke and uh, blood. I busted my head open. They told me I was trying to go to the bathroom. I'm not sure how that happens, but... Um, and that's that's kind of what my drinking was going to look like from there on out. You know what I mean? And I remember thinking that morning, like, I'm never drinking again. That's terrible. That's what happens when you drink. Like, screw it, you know. And nobody drank in my house. You know, my dad, I never saw my dad take a drink. Uh, my mom didn't drink alcohol. She just, uh, she bounced in and out of, like, uh, in and out of consciousness with all the pills she was taking. And my sister wasn't around much, but she was out drinking. So I never saw people be drunk, you know. So I thought that that's being drunk is, is my first experience in them. You know, outside of outside of what what happened that night with, with what the alcohol did, uh, you know that that morning I, when I'm waking up and trying to figure out where I, where I am, I got to go to the, this baseball game where the scout from the college that wants me to come up there and give me a free education to play a sport um, is going to be to sign the papers. You know, and I, I walk into the dugout and I have reek of booze and I watch my co- coach cross my name off the lineup and I watch the scout walk to his car, and then for the first time I saw that look of disappointment on my on my dad's face. You know. And I was to see that look of disappointment like hundreds of times from there on out. But that was the first time. It was the most memorable, you know. And, uh, and I remember just thinking like, oh, well, I still got football. I still got academics. I'm still going to college for free. And uh, little did I know that that was like to become like the biggest trend of my life is anytime I, I face some kind of resistance or obstacle in my life, all I'm going to do is lower my standard just a little bit, you know. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, it, I, I didn't want to go back to drinking, and it took another year before alcohol really takes place in my life and really starts to do something in my life. And um, the way that goes down is in high school, um, all of my friends are getting girlfriends and stuff like that, and they're talking about how great it is. Well, the girls at the school are scared of me because I beat all their boyfriends up. So nobody wants to date me, so I got a bunch of that Smirnoff Ice stuff. Um, it's like a fruity malt beverage kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, I take it to this party, and I start handing them out to all these girls. I'm like, one of these girls is going to get drunk and come home with me, you know? <laughs> and, um, this guy that's been sober for like five or six years now, he, he was actually the one that was at that party and told me, like, that's creepy. You can't. Just... <laughs> you got to drink it, man. You know, so... Uh, so I was like, all right, I'll drink this stuff. You know, it tastes like it tastes like you drop like a Jolly Rancher and some Sprite or something like that. It's not too bad. It's not that 151 crap. I'm, I'm, you know, so I started drinking that stuff, man. And I don't I don't know what's about to happen to me. I got no clue, you know. And uh, and I'm leaving that party and going to another one, and it happens, man. That magical moment, you know, went down, and it was a weird scene. You know, I got a we got like this do rag on my head and a you know tank top and baggy jeans, and I'm listening to like some gangster rap, drinking my smearing off ice. And, uh, <laughs> And it, it happened. That moment happened. And I heard a speaker talk about the same exact kind of thing going down for him. And I knew I was, I was where I was supposed to be in Alcoholics Anonymous. But um, I saw myself in that little side mirror there. And I thought, man, you look good. You're going to get a girl tonight, you know? <laughs> You're, they're going to talk about it on Monday. Just wait. You know? And, uh, and uh, I told my buddy about it. I was like, man, I feel good. You know, I'm not worried about mom or my sister or dad or you know, how pissed I am about at that baseball scout or anything like that. Like, everything's cool, man. I'm not thinking about where I need to be or where I should be or what all these other people are doing. Like, I'm okay right where I'm at. This is, this is really creepy. What's going on? And he said, you're drunk. And I was like, this is it. This is it. I've been looking for this my whole life. Since I was like five years old, I've been waiting for this feeling. I didn't know all I got to do was drink that cheerleader beer. And uh, <laughs> I, I graduated from that stuff. I, I want to make that clear. I became a whiskey drinker. <laughs> Um, but man, it happened for me, you know, and I didn't become a daily drinker like, you know, right away. I, I, I know Monday when I got to school, everybody was like, man, you're a wild man when you get drunk. Let's party this weekend. And I was like, all right. And I, I was the only person in the school with a fake ID. So, uh, so man, I had my end. Like I, I can never, I can't just walk up and talk to somebody. Uh, that's, that's weird. I can't do that. I still have trouble doing that. And, uh, so like that, I need a reason. I need a way to make friends with people. Well, if I'm the guy that's showing up to the party with like, you know, cases of beer and, uh, you know, and handing them out, then I got a way to like get to know people. So, uh, that's what I started to do, you know? And, um, 
And then, uh, you know, I was at the school with a bunch of rich, rich kids. Um, I had been kicked out of a school with not rich kids. Um, and when I got there, these, these guys would like get in trouble, you know, they always had alcohol. They always had their parents' alcohol. So they'd get in trouble with somebody else and they'd say, Hey Terry, I'll give you a bottle of this or a case of this. If you go fight that guy for me. And it was like a win-win situation for me. You know, I get to put my hands on somebody. I get to completely disregard what I'm doing to somebody's son or brother or cousin or loved one. You know what I mean? I get to completely put that out of my mind and, and, and get like some kind of insane, weird pleasure out of hurting somebody. But then I get to get drunk too, and that's really where it happens for me. Is when I, when I get that feeling, when I get that that irritable, restless, and discontentedness removed from me again. You know, that's what I'm looking for, that ease and comfort. And um, and I just started seeking that out, man. And uh, you know, as far as football went, uh, homecoming game, scout shows up to see me play to make sure I'm good to go. Uh, I was on a golf course drinking with some JV cheerleaders. Once again, I just dropped the bar a little bit. And uh, find out like two weeks before uh, graduation is supposed to come around that I've missed so much school that uh, that I'm probably not going to graduate. And that the school over in Daytona that wants to teach me how to build airplanes has retracted their scholarship offer. And that one I didn't, I, I couldn't handle seeing my, that, that look on my dad's face like three times that quick. So, uh, I, you know, I, I did what I had to do and I, I, I walked with, uh, with all my friends and graduated high school. And then I watched all them become grown-ups, right? And they went and got jobs and went to college and the military and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I started breaking into your cars at night and stealing all your, uh, stealing your ashtray change. Um, and uh, man, that was it. Like I, I would literally every night, I would break into cars till about three in the morning. No, five, like five in the morning. And then take the, the ashtray change that me and my buddy had found and we would go get steak and shake. And then go to sleep until like three o'clock in the afternoon. We'd wake up. We'd go and pawn all the you know valuables that we stole out of your car or your garage or whatever the hell we had to do to get it. Um, and get enough cash together to get a couple bottles of booze, you know. And uh, we'd get drunk. And once the buzz started to wear off, we'd go break into your cars again. And when people asked what we did for a living, we uh, we always had some kind of like harebrained scheme that we were up to, you know, like we were starting this this big IT company or something like that. Neither one of us even have a computer, you know. And, um, just, just stuff like that. We did that the whole summer, man. And um, towards the end of that summer, um, you know, I get this girl. I, I, I get this girl to come out to a party, and um, we get good and drunk. And um, you know, the night I met her, we made a baby. And and I was not in any kind of position to be a father. Uh, she called me a few weeks later and told me that that we were having a baby. And I remember thinking, like, oh no, you know, like no. And then the thought came, that kid is going to make me, like, do better in life, you know, so let's embrace this. And I told my dad, I'm having a kid, and he just shook his head. He was like, oh, no, you know. I was like, Dad, you don't understand. Like, I'm going to do good now, you know. And uh, my dad knows me, man. And, uh, you know, a couple weeks after that, I'm running around with that girl. And the cool part about that was that I had found some, uh, like, neighborhoods that I didn't know about where I could break into your cars. And that was Palm Harbor. So if anybody lives in Palm Harbor, you ever had anything stolen out of your car, see me after the meeting. I'll let you know. If you're uh, I'm not going to give you any money. I'm just going to apologize because it might not have been. But, um, you know, so I, I was pretty excited to have some new territory to go run, run my game in. And, uh, and we're out doing that one night, and I get a phone call to go to the hospital, and I show up there, and the first time I ever see my dad cry, first time my dad ever hugged me and told me he loved me, you know, my dad's like a, his hero is Clint Eastwood, you know, he's like a manly man, he's always got hair popping out of his shirt and stuff like that, and he did he done all that stuff, and I was like, man, there's something really messed up, you know, and, uh, and he told me that my mom was dead, you know, and um, I remember the first thought that went through my head was like, I need to go get drunk, you know, and uh, I told my friends that, and they obliged, and um, I, just kept, I just kept on going, you know what I mean, and and at the time, if you would have, like, mentioned things to me, like the phenomenon of craving or peculiar mental twist, I would have said, you're retarded. You know, this is what's wrong with me is that my mom just died. That's why I drink the way I do. And anytime anybody questioned my drinking or my behavior, I said, mom died. You know, leave me alone. Get off my back. And uh, meanwhile, my sister's, like, turning her life around for the better. You know, she's, like, she's out of the gang. She's putting herself through school and doing all kinds of stuff. And it's just great. And um, she's my hero, man. She, she, she's such a, a, a great woman. And I'm watching that happen. And meanwhile, I'm going like the exact opposite direction, you know. And, um, you know, I got this kid on the way, you know. And I tried to go to school. And uh, I lasted like 12 days in school. Um, they even let me on their baseball team. And my coach and uh, the fire instructor over there at that school kind of approached me one morning at about 9 in the morning. and told me to blow into a little tube and 
blow twice the legal limit at nine in the morning. And they're like, not okay, man. You know, I'm trying to be a firefighter and play college baseball and I'm drunk at 9 a.m. You know, so that dream went down the tubes. And, uh, you know what I mean? I just, I, I start lying to my dad, having him drop me off at Chili's and Ruby Tuesdays, telling him that I got a job there. And I just go in the bathroom and wait like 45 minutes for him to leave. And then I call my friends and tell them to come up to the bar and meet with me and we're going to get drunk. And I just keep doing that kind of stuff. And then the kid comes, man. And I remember holding that kid and thinking again, like, this is going to change my life. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do better from now. I'm going to stop this drink and I'm going to get it together. Six days later, I'm in Orient Road being processed for six felonies. And um, I'm thinking, like, man, that went bad. You know? And, <laughs> sure. I'm blaming the kid now. You know what I mean? If it weren't for that kid, I would have stole that car and put it in the lake. You know? Um, I have my own car, too. I don't understand it. But, um, yeah, man, I just I, I couldn't show up for anybody. Couldn't show up for anything, you know? And, uh, and I'm just, like, I'm, I'm ripping and running through people's lives. You know, like, everybody's just kind of, like, stop answering the phone. They stop opening the door. I hear them on the other side of the door while I'm knocking. You know, I hear them whispering, it's Terry. Don't answer it, you know? <laughs> like, I hear you in there. Let me in. I just need two Bud Lights, you know? And I don't know what two drinks looks like. I've never had two drinks. I love when people say, that was always my thing. Somebody would be like, I'd be like, let's go out. And they'd be like, man, you're going to get wasted. I'd be like, two beers. I'd be like, you've never had two beers. You're right. But I'm going to try, you know? And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I kept getting worse. In and out of jail, in and out of jail. Couldn't do anything right. You know, could somebody tell me what time to go to? Okay, sweet. Um, so, uh, you know, I just keep on doing that kind of stuff, man. I come across this girl that's got her life in order. She's living, like, just a good life, you know. She's got her own place, own car, pays her bills, has some money in the bank, all that kind of stuff. I meet her at a bar. I move in with her that night. Um, I just got of <laughs> I had just gotten out of jail that morning. Um, so, you know what I mean? I wake up and I'm like, man, she's got a couch and cable TV. Like, this is sweet, you know? And she's like, so where do you work? And I was like, uh-uh. You know? <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> and uh, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to drink your beer. Can you bring home some food tonight? You know? And, uh, man, she did. I don't know what the hell's wrong with her. Um, she made me get a job eventually, you know. <laughs> she would let me drive her car on my suspended license to that job because that's the only way I was going. Like, if I'm getting dropped off at work, no, it's not happening. I'm staying home, you know. So I would drive all over the streets of Tampa without a license and run from the police every so often and stuff like that. And uh, kind of the way that the, what my life became was just like this, and it never got any better or any worse. Um, I'd go to that job. I'd get paid cash at the end of the night. I'd show up at her place of business. She worked in a restaurant as well. Um, I'd wait for her to get done, and, uh, you know, about five minutes before she's getting done, I'd say, hey, let's go over to the bar and have, have a picture with, with all of our friends. And she would go, no, no, no. And I would say, come on, you know, we should do it, we should do it. It's been a rough day, you know, I've had a long day. You know, I worked really hard. And, uh, and eventually she came and she said, okay. And we'd go over there, and uh, we'd have that first picture, you know, and, and it, it wouldn't set in just yet. I wouldn't get that ease and comfort just yet, but I knew it was coming, so I'd come up with an excuse. You know, oh, let's get something to eat, or look, Joe just showed up. Let's buy him a drink, or whatever. You know, next thing I know, the lights are flashing, and uh, it's the last call. I got five minutes till 3 a.m., so I got to run across the street to the 7-Eleven and grab a six-pack or something to take home with me. And then, uh, and then the regret comes in. You know, the thing, the things that I've regretted so much coming in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I don't remember anything from the lights flashing to waking up. And when I wake up, she's got a look on her face like. She's so scared of me, you know what I mean? And I know I did it again. I got no clue what it was. The only things that I know is I, I wet the bed damn near every time I get drunk. I black out and I pee on the bed, right? <laughs> That's not so bad. That shouldn't cause this look, you know? And uh, every once in a while she would tell me, and it was, always, it was always terrible stuff, stuff that I don't like to admit, you know what I mean? Things that I'm not proud of at all. And um, she stuck around, man. She stuck around hoping to, hoping to fix me one day. And, um, and uh you know, I would tell her, like, I'm not going to drink tonight, baby. I'm going to come home. We're, we're going to cook dinner and watch a movie and, and, and play with the dogs and just have a nice, quiet night. And, and I would see a little hope in her eyes, you know. Be like, all right, good. And then, uh, you know, on my way to work. And I meant it. You know what I mean? I meant it. I, I, I would really want to do that. I would really want to have some semblance of a normal life. And uh, on the way to work or throughout the shift at work or somewhere along, along the day, I would decide that 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 was a little extreme and I could have a couple beers tonight. And I'm going to go try it again and, and – uh, drink safely and control it tonight, you know? That's a big cockroach. Um, <laughs> sorry. Well done. I'm proud of you. I couldn't have done that. That thing was on my four-step. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 
You know what I mean? I wanted some semblance of a normal life, and a normal life bit me in the ass. I wouldn't know it. You know, I had no idea what a normal life looked like. And uh, I remember we had this we had this project my senior year in high school. They said, write down everything that you want in life that will make you happy. And what I wrote down was, I want a nice place to live, close to the water. I want a car, a motorcycle, a couple dogs, a nice girl, some big screen TVs, and a little bit of money in the bank. I wasn't I wasn't shooting too high there. I thought that was that was pretty accomplishable, you know. And I had all that stuff, man. I looked around that place, and not not because of me, because of her, you know. <laughs> Trust me, I was doing everything to make sure we didn't have anything. And uh, you know, I got all that stuff there, man. And every night I'm going to bed thinking about how I'm, how, how I don't want to wake up the next day. I remember that always being my last thought. I don't want to wake up tomorrow, you know. And uh, always waking up and my first thought being damn it again you know that was what was really happening i couldn't voice that to anybody that was what was really going on though and uh you know it, it just it got to the point where she told me uh she told me at one point that that we needed to get married uh so i bought her a ring and uh the way i proposed was i put it on the coffee table and started playing xbox and when she got home i was like there's your ring and uh <laughs> so we started playing in a wedding and uh <laughs> um we're getting close to the wedding. I realize what's about to happen. I do the honorable thing uh, to let her know that I'm not really on board with it, and I go out and cheat on her. Um, the girl that I go out and cheat on her with happens to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous today. So, uh, you know, I just I, I found somebody that drank like me. I was like, yeah, she's not going to care. So uh, I did that, and then, uh, you know, I ran to Philadelphia shortly after that to sober up. I got up there. I moved in with some uh, some three kids that were going to be doctors. They were going to the University of Penn to be doctors. And uh, I found them on Craigslist, so they had no idea what was coming out of me. <laughs> I show up to their house, like, coming off a three-and-a-half-day binge, you know, detoxing, like, just booze pouring out of me. And I got, like, I got my, you know, my life savings, uh, which is a duffel bag of clothes and 72 cents. And um, they just look at me, man, and they're like, your, your room's on the second floor. Rent's due on the first. Here's your key. Bye. You know, and they just stayed out of my way. And uh, I went up there, and I, I, I transferred uh, locations at my job. I go to work the first night. The guy asked me why I'm there, and I'm like, I gotta sober up. I gotta get my life together. Dan, Dan's like, that's great. Let me know if you need any help. I'm like, Sweet. After work, they hand me hundred dollars cash. I say, Hey, Dan, where do we drink? And Dan's like, What the hell's wrong with you, man? And I was like, Don't just mind your business, man. Where's the bar? You know? And uh, and I found I found my bar. I found this bar where there was like a fight happening down at the end. There was a girl that looked like she would have gone home with the Cookie Monster. Like she would have taken anybody home. And uh, they had a little bit of food. They served like really cheap drinks, and you. You could have peed at the bar stool and nobody would have cared. And like, I was like, I'm home. You know what I mean? Like, this is my guy. Everything I need is right there in that seat. And uh, I, I lived there, man. And that girl moved up there to like try to fix me again. And I'm trying to kill myself. You know, my first introduction to a 12 step program is uh, I got Baker acted three times in the same week Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Friday, the doctor told me that he thought I was a crazy person. Really, I'm just a drunk and I need to go to this meeting. He told the girl about it, so she made sure I went to the meeting. And what happened is, is I walked into the room and I saw the same thing you would have seen tonight when you walked into this room was a bunch of happy people smiling, um, talking, laughing, things like that. And I thought, these people are nothing like me. And I left. And I went home that night and I got drunk and tried to kill myself again. And um, I just kept trying to do that, man. And, uh, you know, eventually she leaves. Um, I come out of a blackout on a motorcycle in South Carolina running from cops. I try to kill myself again. You know, it's like attempt number seven. I wake up again. Um, I do that time up there in South Carolina, and I get back here, and I swear I'm not going to drink, and I drink again, and it's nothing spectacular. It was just like every other time, um, except I got kicked out of a bar that nobody's ever been kicked out of before. <laughs> and, uh, I, w I woke up that next morning, and I had that, that's, it, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like chit-chat in my head anymore. It was something screaming, I can never do this again. It was like loud, you know what I mean? And I was like, what the hell is that? And, uh, I didn't like God. If God did exist, I wasn't cool with him, but I started praying because I, I had seen, the steps when I walked into that room in Philadelphia, I'd seen God up there and I just started praying like, God, if you are out there, I don't like you, but can you please help me not drink today? And I just, I would pace, you know, I was pacing, praying and I'd do this in a room with people and they would be like, what's wrong with him? And my friend that knew what was going on would be like, oh, he's not drinking. And they'd be like, there's an easier way, <laughs> you know, plugging a jug don't work for me. And um, I'm going nuts, man. And I know I'm about to drink any moment. And I call, I call a guy that got sober when we were 20 and he took me to AA for the first time. I heard this old dude from Kentucky up there talking. He told a story. I didn't hear much of it, but I know that I related to the way that he drank. And I remember thinking and like the words saying in my head, that guy has been reading your mail. He's been reading your letters to God. 
you know, that's weird. You need to take him out after the meeting. And um, I had planned, I had planned his demise after the meeting for knowing what I was like, you know. But what happened, what really happened was these three guys, younger guys came up to me. They introduced themselves to me. They took me to the hospital to see this other guy that was in a vicious moped accident and shattered his leg. And on the way there, I'm thinking, you guys get moped accidents? Like, they say, hey, sounds fun, you know. And, uh, but the deal was, man, is all those guys looked like they were doing better than me because they had socks on. I uh, was pretty sure that they had underwear on and they had showered within the last 48 hours. I'm staying in a crack motel with a box of clothes, none of them clean, no socks, no underwear, no toothbrush. You know what I mean? That's how I get here at 24 years old. And um, it took me under their wing, man. I was telling Tally about it on the way out here um, that uh, they took me all over the state. They took me to these conferences, you know, across the state and to Louisiana. They took me to New Orleans to a convention where no convention actually took place, but we were in the French Quarter. So I ran around Bourbon Street 30 days sober in the middle of the Gay Pride Festival for a whole weekend. <laughs> and I stayed sober. And that's amazing to me. You know what I mean? Like, I remember getting back on the way back to Tampa being like, I had a drink somewhere in there. Like, I slipped a pill or something. Something happened. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, last month when I picked up my three years, I remember thinking on the way up to the podium, like, you need to turn around, man. You know you, know you did something over the last three years. And I, I can't remember anything. And it's just unbelievable to me that I haven't had a drink or anything, you know, in three years. It just blows my mind still. And um, hey, that's not a long time. Tommy's been sober for like 106 years. And I just can't even... <laughs> I can't even fathom it. You know what I mean? Like the three-year deal, like it just blows my mind. But um, those guys that introduced me, introduced themselves to me that, that first night, the first four had all been sober for like a few years. And I remember thinking like either you're lying or you're not like me. The guy that had shattered his leg in that accident, he had been sober for six months. And that I could buy. And what really got me into AA was that guy's little kid was running around the room. And that guy's little kid said, uh, he said, I love my dad so much. I love hanging out with him. And when that little kid said that, my world came to a screeching halt. Everything stopped. And I remember thinking, I want what these people have. As, as, as insane as it is, the guy that just wrecked the bicycle with the motor, I want what he has in life. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I picked up a white chip for a week. My sponsor told me to do that, and I did it, you know? And, um, and I got involved in service really quick, and I wasn't too hot on the steps until this girl told me that once I did my steps, we could date. Um, and, Spots, I need to do my steps, you know? And he's like, all right, you know, he doesn't care. And uh, he just thinks it's cool that I want to get sober, you know? And uh, he started taking me through my steps, man. And, uh, and I moved into a house with, with four other guys. You know, five of us had this house, and uh, we all lived together, and we put new guys on the couch all the time, you know? And uh, we kicked new guys out of the house all the time, you know what I mean? And it was, it was awesome. It was wild. We had parties there every night, you know? And, uh, and in that backyard, we, we built a little fire pit, and sitting around that fire pit one night, I met the love of my life, you know what I mean? And uh, it's just unbelievable what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous, because I, I come in here just, like, beat down, you know, just done. And uh, next thing I know, you know, I've been at the same job for, for a little over three years now. The guy hasn't fired me. I've been working for him for eight years on and off. We actually, like, went through our emails of every time he fired me. I never lasted more than 25 days. I've been working for him for three years without being fired. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, you know, um, I had the opportunity at, at about a year and a half sober to make amends to my sister, and it just kind of ha happened randomly. You know, I, I did get a new sponsor about six months sober. He took me through the steps again. Um, and, uh, and I'm sitting there having lunch with my sister one day and it just starts pouring out, you know, and, and, uh, we cried, we hugged. She, uh, at the end of it, she said, you know, I'm glad I can have a brother now. And, uh, and that's it, man. We've been brother and sister since then. And I didn't know how to do that. You know what I mean? And, and about two months ago, I was at dinner with my, with my father and his girlfriend and I was able to make amends to them as well. And, uh, you know, I got to see my dad cry again and I, that wasn't, that wasn't the, uh, that wasn't the, the goal or the aim, but he knew, you know what I mean? He knew, he knew what I was trying to do. He understands and, and uh, he absolutely loves what Alcoholics Anonymous has done in my life so much that he saw one of his, ki one of his friend's kids drinking the way that, that I drink. And he called me and he asked me if I could help him. And I remember thinking my dad's calling me for help. That's unbelievable, you know? And, uh, you know, my kid, uh, I picked him up from the airport last week. He had gone to spend a week and a half with my sister. And he comes running out of the airport and he just ran. He jumped and he landed on me and he's, he's eight. He thinks he's like three, like that size, but he's eight. He's a big kid, man. He, he damn near took me out there at the airport, you know. Jeez. Like, and uh, that was the greatest feeling ever. That was the greatest feeling ever to hold that little boy in my arms, you know what I mean? And just to be able, be able to be there and be present. And him not having to wonder, like, what jail's dad in now? What state is dad locked up in now? Where's dad at now? You know, is dad still drunk? You know what I mean? And he don't got, he don't got to think about any of that. He don't got to worry about any of that. My dad doesn't have to do that. My sister doesn't have to do that. They all know where I'm at. They all know that I'm at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous pretty much every night. Um, you know, they've gotten to meet a lot of the guys that, that I'm friends with and a lot of guys that I've sponsored and stuff like that. And, uh, 
And, uh, you know, they, they absolutely love this thing. And for a while, my sister gave me hell about it. She said, can't you drink yet? You still got to go to those meetings? That kind of stuff. You know, she just wants to have a couple beers with her little brother. And uh, her fiancé didn't know that I was sober. And he offered me a beer one night. She said, he can't drink. He helps people stay sober. And I remember thinking, like, man, that's cool, you know. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me far more than I ever could have put together for myself. I'm 100% convinced of that, that I am too dumb um, to put together any kind of good life for myself. But when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, they all told me, a bunch of people told me, because um, I, I like to think I'm smart and I let people around me know that. Um, and they kept telling me, they said, Terry, you better get dumb, man. We bury smart people all the time. You better get dumb real quick. And uh, I remember thinking, like, all right, I'll get dumb, whatever, you know. And um, all get dumb meant was, like, just let us show you what to do. Just let us do, do our job. Let us take you to the steps. Let us show you how to be a member of society. Let us show you how to be a home group member. That's it. That's all they wanted to do is show me how they live their lives. And if I'm dumb, if my what dumb really means is open-minded and willing. Because um, <laughs> when I'm smart, I know better, and I'm going to do it my way. So that's the, that's the reason for the term. But uh, if I'm dumb, I can, I can listen to you guys a little bit, and I can start to take some direction. And, uh, you know, I got dumb. I f here, here's the reason why is that they pointed out to me like, dude, you have ruined your life over and over and over and over and over and it's never gotten any better and it keeps getting worse every time that you take another shot at making it better. So why don't you let us do it for once? And I was like, all right, because when it goes bad, I'm going to blame all you people and I'm going to tell everybody <laughs> how Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't work. That was, I remember thinking that and uh, man, then next thing I know, like I'm getting a driver's license, you know, <laughs> You guys got to see my driver's license picture. I'm crying, and I'm trying to hold it back, and the guy's like, dude, chill, and I'm like, I can't. <laughs> uh, I hadn't had a driver's license for like six and a half years, seven years coming in AA, you know, and then uh, I buy a car, you know what I mean, and I remember like, I got insurance for it too, and <laughs> screwing the license plate on that thing, and I get in it for the first time, and my girlfriend hops in, and she's like, he gets to drive me around for once, you know, and uh, she's all excited, I just start crying, you know, she's like, stop crying, I'm like, eh. <laughs> I'm a crier, man. I was never a crier. I used to make fun of Dave for being a crier. I remember I heard him speak and he started crying. And I was like, you, you sissy. And uh, then I talked like three days later. And I was like bald. Like I had to stop and like walk away from the podium for like two minutes. And I called my sponsor afterwards. I was like, boss, what the hell is this? And he was like, you're grateful, man. You're grateful for the life that Alcoholics Anonymous has given you. And that's exactly what it is. The life that I have today is what Alcoholics Anonymous has given me. I've done everything to get in the way of that progress. I've done everything to ruin it. I've done everything to mess it up and thwart it. But for some reason, the sponsor will continue to call. My sponsor will continue to call me. One of the guys from my sponsorship family, my home group, somebody, Tommy. You know, Tommy saved my life. He, he gave me something to do. I tried to mess it up, you know, and he, he just held me accountable to it. And, um, and it kept me in Alcoholics Anonymous even when I didn't want to be. Even when I wanted to take credit for all the things that were in my life that I knew I had nothing to do with. And uh, throw them away. You know, you guys were there to keep me here. You guys have been there to keep me here. And, uh, and in doing so, you give my family, you know, their, their son, their brother, their father, their cousin. Um, you give my boss, his, his employee, you know, and now, like, actually oversee other people. Um, you know, you, you've given me a life that, that is just beyond anything that I could ever imagine. I, I, I wouldn't have drawn it up this good as a five-year-old with all those lofty expectations and dreams and innocence. I wouldn't have drawn up what I got today. And that's all thanks to you people. Thank you for getting me to God. Thank you for getting me to AA. Thank you for my sobriety. Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you.